Sure. That was good, sure. I liked the yes ma'am from that side. Um, I have to do something slightly unconventional. I have to go get something I dropped that's underneath the piano. Excuse me. I need this for later. Anyway, good morning. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. For those gentlemen in the room who are biologically fathers, thank you. For those who have supported and encouraged and trained up other children in your lives, thank you. It is greatly appreciated. And more importantly, you're loved by many. Um, we have a, one announcement that I'm aware of. And that is that this week we have art camp. Um, we have 65 children descending upon us tomorrow. 65. <laughs> so I would ask that you be in prayer for that. Um, Damon and a few others and I will quite need it. And if you find that you have a few hours on your hands and you would like to share, um, your gifts and talents of stick figures with the kids, we would gladly take you from 4 to 6 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Are there any other announcements? All right, well then, stand as you are able and we will sing our first hymn. follow along with me. As children of God, together we strive to fulfill God's great requirement. To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. 
As the one body of Christ, together we strive for the greater spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts that encourage and console others, and gifts that build up the church. As a community of faith, together we strive to fulfill the great commandment. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. As followers of Jesus, together we strive to fulfill his new commandment. To love, to love one another as Jesus loves us, unconditionally and sacrificially. As co-workers with God, together we strive to fulfill the Great Commission. To go and make disciples, teaching everyone to fulfill all that Jesus teaches us. First scripture reading today is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The word of God for the people of God. didn't turn around that time. <laughs> so this is the point where we get to share our joys and our concerns. Um, and I do have a few joys that I would like to share with y'all. Um, the first one, of course, is for the fathers that are in the room and do grab one of these booklets that are out on the center table before you leave so you can see where you were honored in the book. Now, we have a bunch of people who were graduated from higher institutions, whether they are um, high schools or colleges, graduate programs, etc. Do keep those people in your minds and in your hearts as they move on to the next step in their lives. Um, I want to show you something that I ran over there to get. Um, it's a little slip of white paper. Um, these little slips of white paper are used every Sunday in church. Do you know what they're for? Good answer. I'll tell you. They keep count of how many people are in church. Um, there's spaces on here for the nursery children. There are places on here for children in children's worship. There's p places for visitors. And there's um, the choir and even clergy and just you folks sitting all in the room. And every week it's kept track of, and we have been so blessed as to have Mr. Cliff Toller keep track every Sunday for years and years. Um, a few weeks ago, I was in the back, and I saw this little slip of paper sitting there, and I picked it up, um, and I was so thrilled to see that it said FCC April 14th, 19, for 2019, total in attendance, and it was blank because his cheat sheet was right next to it with about 15 columns of numbers getting everything down to 77 folks in attendance. That happened to be the last time that Cliff was here and counted our heads in this room. And last night, he went on to be with God at about 8 p.m. And I imagine him getting up there with his little slip of paper in his hand and his pen and saying, all right, let's count them. So um, there will be services sometime this week. The plans haven't been finalized, um, but we will work on doing a phone call um, for all folks who are in attendance. So if you don't get email, you'll be able to um, find out about the services. And I also would just like to share, um, both Betsy and Elizabeth have been so thankful for your prayers. And Betsy has said, please do not bring any food today. It is all taken care of. 
and um, they will actually be celebrating Father's Day at Elizabeth's house. So do continue to keep them in your prayers as they go on this next step of their journey. Are there any other announcements? Oh, I think you should. When you forget the first time, or I do, I come back to it the second time, so you're good. All right, uh, now it's time for us to go to prayer. Will you bow your heads with me? Dear God, we can say we know of your love and that we respond in kind, but far too often we do not respond in loving ways towards others. We support ministries of compassion and ministries of the church without ever truly feeling the deep compassion that service demands. I ask that we dig deeper into our souls expose the selfishness and the fear that seem to block out true discipleship. Engage us in doing justice in which the kind of love that you call us to is required, not just in our spoken word, but in our very, very passionate nature. Free us and inspire us to love all, those whom he, we would deem unlovable and those whom we would find it easy to love. Help us to love ourselves, respecting ourselves in gratitude for the gifts you have given to us, and then move us to use these gifts in service to you. Because in your kingdom, Father, all are loved for who they are, not what they do. And in your kingdom, all are forgiven for what they do and don't do. And in your kingdom, all are welcomed and fed. We ask these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, as we pray the prayer given to us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
We come to a very special place in our service, which has special meaning to me and each of us. For this faith family, we are welcome and invited to a table. A table through an invitation not from me, not from this church, but from Christ himself. A table that welcomes all who have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. So please feel welcome to this table. Please join me in prayer. O oh, gracious, loving, heavenly Father, I quote King David who cried out, Who am I? And I say, Who are we? That you would love us so much that you allow the sacrifice of your one and only Son for the forgiveness of our sins. A reconciling act that brings us back into that special relationship with you where we stand in your very presence at this moment, righteous and sinless and blameless. For as we come to this table, may we ponder these truths. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. On that night in the upper room with his disciples, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you partake of it in remembrance of me.
the love of Christ, the blood of the new covenant. These are the gifts of God for each and every one of us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. We come to a, uh, the time of our offering, and I came in this morning not prepared to do this, uh, but I was asked to do this, so I walked in and I sat down and I thought, all right, Lord, you're dealing with a blank slate, <laughs> as usually you are with me, so give me something to think of. And this was, I just have to share this with you because it was so strange. Um, the word freedom came to my brain. I thought, no idea how that fits with offering, but freedom just came to my head. And I thought, well, okay, God's given me the word freedom. How's this work? This is a beautiful process because the process of giving in this church, there is no rule. There's no person hanging over your head to make sure you give. It is just a beautiful thing that we can just give what we like, give, give in any way we can, financial gifts, our time, our love. And I thought, okay, I, I can see how that works, God. And then Jillian gets up and reads, Galatians 5, 13 to 14. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Not only do you use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's overwhelming to me. <laughs> so thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give. God, put these offerings to your use. In your son, we pray. Amen.
seated. Good morning. Good Good to see you all. I was in a formal capacity at the table, but looking out at all of you, it is truly a blessing to be here. And just throughout this service, and Damon said to me afterwards, I hope you don't mind me picking on you one more time. He said to me afterwards, that was weird. And I was thinking, in a way, it is weird. It is weird in the sense that it is transcendent, and yet it's such a beautiful thing when we feel to a degree, helpless or unprepared, and it's, in the words of Paul, when we are weak, there we find ourselves strong. And I can't imagine if you had had three hours to think about what you were going to say, that it could have been any more perfect than that, and that's the way that God shows up. We have our part to do, and we do our part, but sometimes we are on the spot asked to do some things, and it is just an extraordinary experience when God does God's part, and God always does. We are going to turn our attention now to the gospel according to St. Matthew. And this will be the second time we've heard the greatest commandments given, this time by the greatest teacher the world has ever known or will ever know. Jesus, the one we call Savior. Jesus, the one we call Christ. Jesus, the one we call teacher. Jesus, the one we call brother. And Jesus, the one we call friend the one who makes the transcendent one very near to us. It's hard for us to get our minds around that, that God, the creator of all that is, God, the one who speaks things into being, and they are, and they are good. God spoke us into being, and fundamentally, we are good. And this scripture reading in St. Matthew helps us recognize how we can become more and more the good people that we were created to be, the great people that we were created to be. So let's turn our attention to chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. May our lives be transformed by the reading and hearing these words. Amen.
deliberating over whether or not to say this a moment ago, because some of you would say, please don't. There's part of me thinking, I need not say anything after that hymn, because that hymn says it all, and not just the words, but the way it's communicated through those lovely voices and their soul and their spirit and the gift that they are. Nevertheless, I've prepared this message, so I'm going to go ahead and share it. <laughs> I am doing some of you a favor this morning. You know how I like to come out from behind the pulpit and pace back and forth, and some of you have commented that I'm going to give you vertigo by doing so, because I go from one end to the other. And part of that is you may not realize is there is this always desire within me. I'm actually trying to connect with each and every one of you. I really am. I, I see you and it's like I almost want to reach out and touch you. There's something that's powerful when on occasion I can get myself out of the way and God does what God does and there's just this sense of connection and I, I'm eager. It's like I just want to be nearer to you. So that's part of why I come out from behind the pulpit but there are a couple of reasons I'm not going to. One is in my youngest daughter, Evie, when she was little and she would hear Valerie wearing um, some formal shoes, she called them clop-clop shoes because they would clop through on a hardwood floor where I'm wearing clop-clop shoes this morning. And so if I were down there, you wouldn't be able to hear me. All you would hear is clop-clop and that would be somewhat of a distraction. The other reason is I had a friend take me fishing for the first time in the Outer Banks this past Friday and it was pretty choppy and we were out there from 7 o'clock in the morning till after 4 o'clock and it was such that you had to brace yourself to stand up the whole time. Well this morning, and I'm not exaggerating, my hamstrings were seizing up and my left hamstring at one point seized all the way up so I'm not sure I could walk back and forth <laughs> this morning so I'm going to stay back here. But I'm going to share one thing as a father, something that I'm so proud of. I know many of you can't see it from where you are, but there are little hands on here. And speaking of Evie, this was 2005, or this is Kate, 2005. She was a tiny, tiny little thing, and she made this for me, and it's my favorite tie, and I get to wear it once a year. So just wanted to share that with you, with our <laughs> family of faith. That is a deep joy for me. I realized that the primary thing standing between you and your special lunch for many of you is how long I talk, so I'm going to try to get to it, and I'll try not to spend too much time. I don't know they're shaking their head. That's right. I do want to give you just a quick review. We're doing a five-part series, and some of you think, oh, Lord, he's going to talk about something for five weeks, and I appreciate your patience, and I appreciate your tolerance, and tolerance in itself is an act of love. It really is. It means that we're, to some degree, a little bit irritated or it's requiring something of us, but as we know from the scripture readings that we saw this morning, we've been commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves, and I am your neighbor, and so you're going to have to love me for the next three weeks, including this Sunday. We have three more parts, but very, very quickly, I'm going to share where we've been because some of you have not been here for the first two parts. Some of you are visiting. Some of you have been out of town and had other kinds of events that you needed to be a part of, but we've been talking about striving for greatness, striving for greatness. And for some of us, striving was required for us to even be here this morning. It wasn't easy to get here. For some of us, we have health issues. For some of us, we had to travel from some distance. For some of us, we just felt like doing something else, and this is, is you. I don't have to tell you. There's a better preacher on TV right now as we speak, so you didn't come to hear me, but you are motivated and inspired by this wonderful choir and the wonderful family that this is, and you encounter God sometimes in spite of me, and so I'm grateful for that. That takes a little bit of the pressure off of me, but the striving, we've all been called to strive, and to strive means that we're devoted to something. We're working at something diligently. We're committed to it. We give our mental energy. We give our spiritual energy. We give our emotional energy. We've all been called to strive for greatness. If we were in some other culture, that might come as a surprise, but it's a part of our very society. It is a part of our culture. We're born into a culture that emphasizes greatness, success, accomplishment. It's a part of our DNA in the society into which we're born. And I think it's important, though, for us to understand greatness from a biblical perspective, from a Christian perspective. I say Christian meaning Christ-like. We are seeking to understand what greatness is in our society we know that a presidency was won on the promise to make America great again and as I've said in weeks past I don't think there's any American 
who would suggest that we would not want to be great. I think we all want to be great, whether we're Republican or Democrat. And my hope for all of us, and you know I say this, not with the intent to antagonize or to create any adverse response, but I believe for all of us, whether we are Democrats or Republicans or Tea Party or Green Party or no party, that our highest aspiration is that we become better Christians. I don't know that Democrats need to convert Republicans or Republicans need to convert Democrats. I believe that wherever we are, we should all be striving to be better Christians wherever we find ourselves. What a better world this would be if Democrats were better Christians, if Republicans were better Christians, if apolitical people were better Christians. And so that's what we're focusing on. We are called to greatness, and we could have entitled this sermon series any number of things, but greatness is a part of the language of our society, so we're helping to understand it and perhaps even redefine it in some ways. We are called no longer to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So week one, we looked at fulfilling the great requirement. Fulfilling the great requirement. You all know what that is, whether you recognize it or not. In our weekly responsive reading, we are internalizing these deep values, and it requires some repetition because we get a number of messages and images and notions of what greatness is from a number of different directions. And so even our responsive call for the last two weeks, three weeks, including this one in the next two weeks, so five total, we are internalizing these scripture references. So the great requirement is the, that we are to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with our God. Last week we saw for Pentecost that we have all been given gifts. The gift of the Holy Spirit is available to each and every one of us. The gift of the Spirit that was available and hovered over the waters and the deep. The Spirit that God breathed into the nostrils of those first human beings, the spirit that gives us our very breath, but the spirit that was poured out some 2,000 years ago in an extraordinary way and empowered people to do things that they didn't have the capacity to do prior to that. They were empowered. They were given courage. They were given strength. And they were able to do, in the truest sense of the word, some otherwise phenomenal things that they had not been able to do before. But we are to strive for the greater gifts. There are people who have extraordinary gifts, but we recognize that these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And we recognize that our gifts are in some measure neutral. People have been, the, been given the gift to communicate. And we know that sometimes people's gift for communication has been used for reasons contrary to God's will. There have been people who have been given the gift of administration, let's say, and they've used their gifts for reasons that were contrary to God's will. We are all called to exercise our gifts in love, and where there is love, there is encouragement, there is consolation, and there is edification to build up. Our gifts we're called to use to build people up, to build communities up. And so as we consider greatness, we need to ask ourselves, Within ourselves, within our churches, within our society, within our political affiliations, within our educational systems, on the local level, in our families, wherever we are, is it greatness that we are really valuing? Is it just? Is it kind? Is it humble? Does it encourage? Does it console? Does it build up? If it doesn't, then it's not greatness from a biblical understanding. And so that leads us to this third part where we are emphasizing the greatest commandments ever known. Again, offered by the greatest teacher the world has ever known. We are called to love God. That seems simple enough. And it is simple in concept, but it's anything but simplistic and it's anything but easy. We are called to love God. Not the word God, not merely our conception of God, not merely our current experience of God, but to love God as God is. We use these words that can in no way capture the reality, the transcendence of who God is. Every person in this room is finite. Every person in this room has a limited understanding of who God is. And I would submit, as difficult as this is to hear, that each and every person in some area is actually wrong about God. 
There's something that we have attributed to God. There's something we believe about God. And as finite beings, there are some areas that not only need to be complemented, as in fleshed out, completed, there are some areas that need to be corrected. And the awareness of that, the humility of that, is in itself an act of love toward God. But we want to grow in our understanding of God and our knowledge of God. And I believe that the more we understand God as God is, the more we know God as God is, we cannot help ourselves but to love God because God is so wonderful. God's love for us is so remarkable, so extraordinary, such that God's love really does not fit into our mental categories, and no matter how much of God we've experienced, we have not experienced all of God. But that which we have experienced, if it is God, we know that God's love for us is unconditional, and our response is one of gratitude in the proper sense of the word. But we're called to love God with all of our hearts. Loving God with all of our hearts is often with our emotions. That's what we attribute to our hearts most often, our emotions. And if we're in a good season of life, if everything is going well, if we are feeling blessed, it's easy to love God with our hearts. But we know that not all seasons are as we would have them be. There are times when we go through excruciating loss. There are times when something happens to us. There are times when something happens to one of our loved ones, and that can be the most difficult. And one of the greatest challenges we have is overcoming that theological conundrum that people have tripped over since the beginning of time. We say that God is all-powerful, and we say that God is all-loving. And when something unimaginable happens to us, when something devastating happens to us, it's hard for us to love God with our whole hearts if we have been told that God is all-powerful and all-loving. God, if you are all-powerful and all-loving, how could you let that happen to me? God, if you're in control of all things, how could you let that happen to my loved one? It's a difficult theological conundrum for us to get over. I think one of the ways for us to begin to understand is, number one, to recognize that God does not cause all things, but God is always operating to cause all things to work for good. We are not puppets. God is not a puppet master. There are some things that are not someone's fault that are no less devastating, and that makes it, too, difficult for us to love God with our hearts, with our emotions, with our feelings. It's difficult when we are in pain. And it is my hope and it is for many of us our experience that we have developed a relationship with God over time. Because if we haven't, it becomes too late in the midst of that pain to trust that God is good, to trust that God is is operating to heal us, to see us through, to walk with us, to help us carry the burdens that we could not carry on our own, to have experienced God's love to such a degree that we recognize just that. God does not cause all things, but God can cause all things to work for good. And those things we don't understand about God, our experience and our knowledge of God transcends our understanding. But if we wait until we find ourselves in those circumstances, we want answers because we don't have the experience and knowledge, and ultimately, we find that unsatisfying. So part of our loving God with our hearts is cultivating that relationship over time so that we grow to know God as God is, and knowing God as God is, we know that God is a God of love. We're called to love God with all of our soul, our soul. Our soul is understood in a number of different ways, and it's not my hope to be precise with each one of these, but to help us reflect about the possibilities of the way that we can love God. To love God with all of our soul, with our will. We have choice, we have freedom, which is why we sometimes find ourselves in circumstances that we did create, sometimes find ourselves in circumstances we didn't create, but someone else did. We do have free will. God is not controlling and manipulating us. We have a measure of a free will. And with that free will, we can make choices. We can choose certain paths. We can identify options and choose the one that we want to take. We're 
called to love God with all of our soul, with all of our will, and yet we find ourselves in the human condition. Our human nature is that we are children of God created in God's image, but we have the human condition. And the reason we cite Paul so often is because we can identify with him. Those things I would do, I do not do. Those things I vowed not to do again, I find myself doing again. I'm the only one that's done it, that does that, right? <laughs> you all have got it straight. But we're striving for greatness. We're striving to love God. We're striving. Yes, we have the human condition. We are children of God, not fully mature. We're growing in our ability to make the right choices. We're growing in our ability to even know what they are. Sometimes God's will can be elusive to us, but we're growing as we love God with all of our soul. We're growing to love God with all of our minds. Now, as the Christian church disciples of Christ, that should come naturally to all of us. We have been considered by ourselves and others as a thinking church. We think through our faith. We think through what it is that we believe. We think through those faith claims that we make. Simple, seemingly faith claims like, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I proclaim him as Savior of the world. Think about that statement. That statement is not merely the formula that you have to repeat so you can join the church. It's not a formula that we repeat so that we can get into heaven one day. Let's think about that for a moment. Jesus is the Christ. What does that mean? Disciples ask, what does that mean? Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the deliverer. Jesus is the anointed one, the one in whom, through whom, God's spirit dwells. Jesus is the authority, the highest authority, the son of the living God. Jesus is the son of the living God. What does that mean? We are children of God. Jesus is the son of God. He reveals what it means to be sons and daughters of God. He reveals true greatness. He reveals our purpose. He reveals God's purpose. He is Savior of the world. Savior so I can spend eternal life with Jesus and my family and my loved ones, of course, but so much more. His prayer was that we would make of this world the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Salvation is so much more comprehensive than we can fathom. But these are the kinds of things, as good disciples, we're called to love God with all of our minds. God gave us reason. Our faith and our reason are not contrary to one another. Sometimes faith transcends our reason, but they don't contradict one another. There's nothing wrong with intellectual rigor. In fact, I believe God calls us to think seriously because what we think about God affects every area of our lives. How we understand the cross affects every area of our lives. You may not realize that, but it does. How we understand the cross affects how we understand God's justice. Was God's justice satisfied by punishing someone so we could be forgiven? Or was God's justice satisfied because his son, who reveals who he is, took the initiative, even though God is the injured party, to do whatever is necessary to demonstrate to us that God's love is absolutely unconditional. Now, I'm not telling you which one you have to believe, but what I am telling you is how you understand even how the cross saves us, what you think about in terms of your understanding of God, justice, love, grace, forgiveness, affects the way we vote or don't vote. It affects the way we interpret what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. It affects the way that we deal with those closest to us and dearest to us and nearest to us. How we understand God affects every area of our lives. So while we are not doctrinal, we don't ask in our denomination for people to adhere to a certain set of beliefs, but that doesn't mean that we don't take how we understand God seriously. My prayer is that we take it with the utmost sincerity and seriousness because it matters. It affects every area of our life. And then our strength. It takes a great deal of strength to love God. There are times when we struggle, and it's similar to when we're going through a difficult situation where we want God, we want God to do for us what we want God for, to do for us. And when we don't understand, sometimes it can be difficult for us to love God. And so it takes great strength when we're going through difficult times. Now, this next one would seem simple enough until we ask the question, who is our neighbor? We are called to love our neighbors. 
And so, who is our neighbor? Think about that for a moment. In a global society, who is our neighbor? Everyone. Is that true? Is everyone our neighbor? Are other nationalities our neighbors? Other religious traditions, not just denominations, other religious traditions, are they our neighbors? And we are called to love God and love our neighbors. Well, let's look at what 1 John says about that. He says, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. That's a strong statement, isn't it? Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. Now, that word hate is not what we think of when we say hate. Sometimes when we think about hate, we think of a strong, hostile, bitter, unpleasant experience at the thought of another person. Maybe someone has harmed us or injured us or someone we love, and we have this strong, unpleasant, bitter feeling toward them, and that's what we think of hate. That's not what is being addressed here. This understanding of hate is more akin to apathy, a lack of concern, a lack of care for the well-being of another. Those who say, I love God, and yet do not care about the well-being of their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Now, if we are all children of God, who are our brothers and sisters? Everyone. And we are called to love our neighbors. Do our neighbors know national boundaries? This is where it gets serious. There are some controversial matters and we start talking about law. What is the highest law for people who consider themselves people who have said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the Savior of the world? What is the highest law? The highest law. We said he was Christ, the highest authority. We said he's the Son of God who reveals God's will. And we've claimed that he is Savior of the world. And what was his law? Love. Any man-made, human-made law that does not align itself with the highest law to which are we called to be obedient. The law of God. I'm not telling you where to come out on some of these controversial matters. I'm just asking you to consider that wherever you come out. On this particular matter, what does it mean to honor the greatest commandment, to love our neighbor, to love our brother and sister, and we've said that includes everyone, and then we're called to love ourselves. Loving ourselves is not as easy as some may think, is it? For some of us, loving ourselves is the most difficult of all. I can speak from my own experience. There have been times in my life where I had experienced the goodness of God and I had no trouble loving God. There have been times in my life and I've been through some things that you wouldn't want to hear about. I have. I've been through hurts and pains and abuses and neglects, injustices, things that I wouldn't wish on an enemy. I've been through, and that's not poor me. You've been through them too. But having experienced the love of God, we find it easier to even love and forgive those who have hurt us. Now, I'm not talking about like always. Jesus didn't command us to like everybody. Jesus commanded us to love everyone, and by love everyone, we mean we truly wish them well. We only have a desire for their good and their interest. We've been healed of any bitterness and unforgiveness, but when it comes to ourselves, it can be so very difficult for us to love ourselves to see ourselves as God sees us, to forgive ourselves as God forgives us. But this is something that I would remind you of. We are commanded, we're commanded to love ourselves. That's how much God loves us. God wants us to be free, so God even commands it that we would love 
ourselves. And just like our love for others in the moment is not measured by our feelings, our love for ourselves doesn't have to begin with how we feel about ourselves. We don't have to feel it just yet. It's an act of the will before it is an act of the emotions. It is an act of the will before it is an experience of the emotions. We begin to talk to ourselves the way God would talk to us. I'm a child of God. I am forgiven. I am loved. God's love for me is unconditional. God doesn't love me because I am worthy. I am worthy because God loves me. God's love is not a value-seeking love. God's love is a value-creating love. Because God loves us, we are worthy. We are lovable. It's not something we merit. It's not something we earn. It's not something we prove. It's ours to receive. So my prayer for us this morning is that we will indeed love God as God is with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, that we will love our neighbors, truly love our neighbors, whoever they are, if there's a need, and that we will love ourselves as God in Christ loves us absolutely unconditionally. Amen. If there's anyone here this morning who has never made a confession of faith, Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one who reveals God's will. To look at Jesus is to look, a, look at a perfect unity of human and divine will, which is always, by the way, the will of love. That's always God's will. If there's anyone who is not a member of a community of faith, this is an extraordinary community of faith, and we're trying to become a great church from a biblical understanding where we do justice, love kindness, where we walk humbly, where we're striving for the greater gifts, and where we are trying to obey the most important commandments, to treat one another as the children of God we are with infinite dignity and worth because God loves us that much. If you want to be a part of a community of faith where that's where that community is striving for, you're in the right place, look no further. For all of us, we can rededicate ourselves. We have opportunity to strive for greatness as greatness is, to strive for greatness as God reveals. I invite you to stand as you're able and respond as you are led as we sing our closing hymn. <laughs>
now may the love of God that surpasses all understanding, a love that does not fit our categories, the love that sets us free, the love that makes us whole, the love that is our all in all, may that love guard and sustain our hearts this day and forevermore. Amen.